So thank you uh, very much for the invitation um, to speak um, and to be here. Um, I want to talk about information, um, some of the work we're doing at Curtin, but also hopefully a call to arms as to how we can rethink the way we approach um, information in the in the HE sector. But but more on that more on that later. Um, I am with Matthias and with several other people. I'm aware. Um, Coming to you from uh, Wajak Munga Wuja, I'd like to acknowledge um, the elders, uh, past, present, and emerging in this area. I'm privileged to live on a on a small patch of land, um, which we believe um, hasn't been logged um, since colonial incursion. And this um, piece of wood is a fragment from a tree which fell down, which I think is about three hundred years old. And one thing that's striking about this as you, as you look through it is that um, from the sort of birth of this tree through maybe 150 years, there's this regular but complex pattern of dark and light stripes um, in the tree rings, which stop about 100 years ago or 120 years ago. Um, after which it's more irregular, um, bigger burns. And when we talk about knowledge and the transmission of knowledge, I think it's it's worthwhile to think not just about what this represents, not just 150 or 200 years of knowledge transfer and practice, but tens of thousands of years before that of knowledge making, knowledge use and, and knowledge communication. Um, and also what this represents in terms of a piece of data, a piece of information which has cultural sensitivities and, and issues around how we should or could use this. Um, it's a complex piece and I think um, we have a lot to learn um, from the knowledge that um, has been around for a lot longer than we have or many of us have on this land. So I was charged with being provocative. Um, so. Here's where I'm going to start, um, talking about information um, and, the, and the problem with facts, um, the problem with the things that we assume. So I want um, you to, to start by picking a fact, you know, one thing that sort of informs your day-to-day -day work that you rely on, that you, you think about. So QS rankings are out today or yesterday, whenever it was, Leiden ranking was out um, uh, last week, I think that was. Um, so that might be something that you, you lean on to think, oh, yeah, well, I know where I sit in some sort of hierarchy of institutions. Um, and maybe you don't like rankings, but you, you like to think that the ranking doesn't appreciate your institution. So you're quite happy that you sit maybe below some other institutions as well. That's another kind of, of, of fact. Um, some other facts that might be you know, relevant to your day to day um, assumptions about what the biggest discipline in my institution is, um, the idea of what the proportion of your institutional grouping is doing in terms of Australia's research. Um, maybe that there are ways of doing discipline normalization that make metrics um, appropriate to share to look across different disciplines. And the problem with these is at one level, they depend on tools and data sets, which are mostly wrong, uh, which are certainly imperfect and which are mostly black boxes. But at the same time, we need to be able to have information uh, to let us go about our day to day. We can't check these things and calculate them from first principles every day. And as a result, we've come to rely on a very small set of opaque black box information sources, which give information like these kinds of things, which is wrong, um, to be blunt. And I can give you examples of this. Um, but we always make assumptions, we always trust a set of sources, and often those that trust is based on what is traditional, what we've had in the past. And this isn't, I'm not going to say I'm better at this than anyone else. Um, here's an example of me getting something wrong. Um, those of you who know me at all will know that I'm not a fan of publish and read agreements as a general strategy for the long-term move towards open access. Um, but um, I have been talking around the traps in Australia over the last couple of years saying, well, yeah, if you have to make a choice about a way to quickly raise open access, um, then this is a reasonable way to do it. This would be a reasonable way to, to, to take to approach that problem. I was wrong. Um, I've been looking forward to the moment which happened 
late last week when we updated our open access um, website, um, and I'll, I'll shift across and, and show you the live version of this, because what that um, change meant was that we could look at the 2022 figures um, for Australia and, and other countries and other institutions. I'll come back to that. Um, and what they show is, yes, so 2021 to 2022, all of those reading publish agreements coming into place. There's been an increase in the amount of open access mediated by publishers. But the overall open access levels haven't changed. Now, maybe that's to do with embargoes, but I have a suspicion that it might actually be down to the fact we've been so focused in Australia over the past few years on publisher agreements that we haven't been paying attention, except I know for those of you who work in repositories, um, we haven't been paying collectively enough attention to the repository route to open access. And as a result, this is really not just flatlining, but going backwards. Um, and so I got that wrong. I made an assumption that all things being equal, this would add to the system, but it, it looks as though it isn't. Um, and so we all make assumptions. We all work with assumptions uh, to make our, our life better. And, and often we need to question those, I think, a bit more. And we need to question the information sources that, we, that we're working with. Um, I go full scale humanities on this one. You know, facts as a concept, they're tools, they're not reality. They're tools that we use to make our arguments and reasoning more efficient. Um, they're unavoidable because we can't do everything for first principles all the time, but we need to hold ourselves to account um, and look at the data. And we can only do that when the data and information we rely on are available to test, usable, and actually transparent to enable that testing. So I spent a little bit of time talking about the opportunities because the good news is we have much more um, open data and information and transparency in the ecosystem, the information ecosystem um, than we have ever had before. We have more data at our fingertips um, in readily usable form than we've ever had before. Um, some of you may have seen me use this slide before. This is a, a representation of the uh, data scales we have, the data we collect within the context of the Curtin Open Knowledge Initiative. I'll talk a little bit about more how that works, but in essence, what we're doing is integrating other people's open data and bringing it together to make it more usable and applicable. Um, and there's an old version of this slide, and then I update it each time as to how many outputs we're getting from, um, from Open Alex, from Mag, from Crossref, how many institutions we can track through the, the raw metadata, how many countries we have data for, and those numbers keep rising. Um, those numbers continue to rise. And for those of you who are into such things, and again, I'll come back to this, all of this is really underpinned by the revolution that persistent identifiers have offered us to us for data integration. So we're on the verge of this, this new world, this, this, this opportunity to do, to do so much more. As I say, we have more data at our fingertips in a readily usable form than we have ever had before. So why is everyone still using Web of Science? Um, and there's a kind of cynical answer to this. Um, one answer is because you're paying for it. Um, sometimes it feels like if we were charging $100,000 for the, the tools that we were offering, that certain people in the Australian sector, and I know I'm preaching to the choir here, um, would, would, would find it more believable. We, what we found was it isn't just about offering the information. That's, that's not enough. Um, we built this dashboard uh, with the intention of making that data more usable. And then that's, that's certainly been part of it. Um, but there's still a problem. Um, the data might be available. It might be usable in its um, translated and uh, analysed form, 
But what about getting into that data with your fingers and, and really getting into the, the depths of how it works? Um, so here's a simplified version of how that dashboard works. Now, I'm probably splitting the audience at the moment. Um, a few people are going, oh, wow, that's cool. I can see how it all connects up. That makes sense. Another group is saying, oh, yeah, excellent. Love the PIDs. Love the way that those are being connected together. Um, I, can, I can really see how this is, this is fitting together. Um, I suspect the majority of you are saying that's a lot of spaghetti. Um, there's a, it's, a, it's a complicated system. It's transparent. I can show you the plumbing. Um, but is it comprehensible? Um, is a is a is a quite separate question. Um, I can show you the code that drives that. Again, if if you're into code, if you're interested in getting down um, to that level, then then that's great. You can look through it. Um, you can look at the the actual data itself. The data is all open. You can go right back to the source. Um, and really dig into it and find you know, issues or, or challenges or things you would you would want to change. Um, if if neither of those are your cup of tea, then of course there's also the documentation that goes with it. Um, now we track the number of people looking at these things, and the numbers are small. Um, we put a lot of work into making a website, a dashboard um, that is easy to use, that is easy to work through, that is understandable. We put almost more work into trying to document transparently and clearly how the data flows through from various upstream sources, which you can audit, uh, through to um, the website. But we know that relatively few people look at those because it's complicated, because you're busy. Um, because you've got other things to do. Um, and you know, a perfectly reasonable question is, well, wouldn't it be just so you just trust us to do it right? Um, and I want to point back again at the, the use of whether science or scopus or insights um, or dimensions and the fact that what you do when you pay for those services is you're really just trusting a proprietary provider to do it right. You're deliberately paying for something which is a black box. If we open up that box, if we make the argument that transparency, community engagement is better, then we're still really just asking you to trust us. You can just see more of the box. Is that is that enough? And 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 if it's this is the new player, the new way of doing things, that it's complicated and difficult to understand what's going on, is that going to work? And I'm going to argue actually, you shouldn't trust us. Um, and I'm going to come back to that point: the idea that you can just trust a group, you trust me because I'm sitting in a university versus a commercial provider because they're in a company that doesn't make sense. Um, do you trust us because we say some of the right things? Um, I'm going to come back and argue that what you should be looking for is systems and approaches that are trustworthy. Um, and that's really a distinct point. I'm going to take this complexity and I'm going to make it actually even worse. Um, I'm going to point out something we've corrected. Um, and I'm going to start by apologizing to anyone who's from RMIT um, because, well, you'll see in a second. Um, so, just last week, we shifted over the Open Alex dashboard. For those of you who have been watching closely, you probably noticed that on Friday, some bunch of things changed. That was the final part of the process of shifting from Microsoft Academic Graph as our core source of information on which outputs are linked to which institution to using Open Alex. Microsoft Academic no longer exists, so we had to do that. We had to do that shift. Um, and overall, for the 30 odd thousand institutions, well, the 80,000 institutions that are in RAW, the 15,000 or so that we're tracking in that dashboard, um, there's a very, very strong correlation between the numbers of outputs 
um, let me again flip across to the live. This we're going to be pushing uh, this dashboard live, um, hopefully later today or tomorrow. Um, there's a very strong correlation between the number of outputs that we saw in MAG, the number of open in Alex. That's good. That that's good confirmation. The ones that are up here, where there are many more. Um, in Open Alex, we understand those. That's a result of us being able to uh, aggregate outputs up to their parents. So things like the University of California system, these are mostly university consortia where we're now able to, to capture um, those consortia as a whole, um, as well as their, uh, their institutions. Again, power of identifiers, the design of the, the schema for the, for the raw, the uh, red research organization registry, has parents and children relationships, so we can propagate those up and, and get those, those parent organizations and assign outputs to them as well. Now, there are some that are a bit lower, um, and I could give you an example that is anodyne and foreign and from somewhere else in the world, so it doesn't have an effect, but I'm deliberately going to pick the one, oh, it's the wrong one. Oh, here we go. Pick the one that's relevant the Australian context. So what has happened is that it turns out Microsoft Academic Graph was over-assigning, uh, misassigning quite a lot of outputs to RMIT. Um, those, those outputs were mostly coming from European organisations. Um, and as a result, that has another effect when we look at the open access. So we can go, sorry, we do that. Oh. Better next tab. Here we go. It's better. Um, when we look at open access, because the number of outputs that were misassigned were mainly European, they had very, very high levels of open access. And we're now seeing RMIT look as though it has essentially less, less open access as a proportion of total outputs than we were previously counting. Now, is this number absolutely correct? Well, no, of course not. No number is absolutely correct from whatever data source. Is it now having other problems um, relating to the open access portion? Possibly. And really, we need to talk to the people from RMIT to, to dig into whether this number is now better and, and, and more accurate. Um, is the representation of outputs better in Open Alex than it was in Microsoft Academic? Absolutely. We have gone through, we have checked that um, pretty thoroughly. And um, what we're seeing, particularly with what Open Alex are doing in terms of their capacity to assign outputs, um, is, um, is radically improving um, the data that's available to us on a day-to-day -day basis. So this is gonna keep changing. Um, and that's kind of exciting. So where do you come into this? We just switched a data source, but, and this whole complicated picture is not something that all of you are gonna be able to get into on a day-to-day -day basis. Some of you may want to, some of you may, may be resourced to do that. And that's great. Um, we'd love to have those conversations as well, but there are things you know, there are things you know about your institution, uh, how many, outputs did you expect to see? What number should that look like for which year? And what are the patterns year to year? Um, because the coverage is never uh, absolutely complete um, for any data source, but we can at least look at the patterns and make sure that if it should be going up, it should be going up. We should be seeing a dip because of the pandemic. We are we seeing that dip. What's the, you think the proportion of OA outputs are and where are those things and, and how are they um, made open access? Those are things that you know about and you can check, and if there are issues, you can raise them. And every time uh, we get an email from someone that says, ah, eh, that doesn't look quite right, we go in and we check, um, and we work through those and we fix them. If you're in charge of the institution, um, then you've also got the ability to check that you're in the right place. Some institutions are actually registered in the wrong location. That's not wildly helpful. Um, and is in fact the right type of institution. And you can do that and, and correct that up at the top level. Um, 
at the raw registry. So there are opportunities to engage in ensuring that that information that, for instance, maybe the, uh, the uh, research centres and institutes within your organisation are properly captured as, as children um, and, 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 and indeed as parents. Um, maybe you're running a, a publishing operation out of the library um, and you're finding that people are complaining about the fact that things aren't being properly assigned um, to, to the institutions. And there, again, you have the power, if you're in that position, to look into Open Alex to check whether those connections are being made, made properly. And also in the cross-ref metadata, right at the top of this whole cascade of information, to, to correct that at source. You may have different positions, you may have different sort of specific expertise or responsibilities um, for various parts of this overall data ecosystem. Um, and what I want to suggest is that together, we can make something that's much more powerful, that works much more effectively, and that together we collectively get a consistently improving data landscape. Because if we do this in an open data space, then all of these corrections and curations, if we get the architecture right, if we get the systems right, have the potential to be shared globally. And if we do it with a shared set of values and with a sense that those things do need to be shared, oops, sorry, um, my mouse is going to strange places. Um, I knew that well. This is a set of values that we built up in our work with the uh, community consultation process. Um, one of the reasons why I talked through that example of RMIT is that that thing at the top is you know being open about the fact that you know when we have to make corrections, we will make corrections um, and we will make it clear why things have gone wrong in the past, that we act transparently, responsibly, we look to be reparative and that we look to be collaborative. Again, I'll come back to this as I, as I close. This is not about what we at Koki or at Curtin are doing. It's what we do collectively to build a better system and better information. And you know, you might be sitting there, I suspect again, I know not because I'm preaching to the choir, but you know, okay, open access, this is kind of low stakes in some ways. It's not the thing that's burning up the, the national policy agenda um, or, um, or driving things. You know, again, what was, was open access in the news this morning? No, it was the QS rankings. Um, but what if this was high stakes? Um, what if we needed something that was truly trustworthy and not just trusted? Um, what if this wasn't a low stakes question. Um, so for those of you wondering, well, if you don't know what that is on screen at the moment, then please stay that way. It's um, <laughs> it's a much, much better life to be in. But for those of you who do recognize the thing on the left, uh, the thing on the right, it's exactly what you think it is. Um, as many of you will know, um, we built a system for modeling how the era was going to play out um, in terms of the sensitivities and issues around the metrics being used. And so we've built a model of how the ERA was going to play out. Same open data, open source, transparent process. We can argue about exactly how we do all of these benchmarks now, um, but this is not necessarily a low stakes conversation about what choices we're making about the input data into these systems. So I hope what I've tried to get across here is um, the challenges that you face in terms of information systems, in terms of the quality of strategic information you can pass up the chain and the quality of information you have at your fingertips to make the decisions you make on a day-to-day -day basis. Actually, those challenges haven't changed. Um, you still need to figure out which sources of information are trustworthy, which ones are worth using. No one has the time to fact check every last fact or number. 
Um, generally in the past, because we had these black boxes that were given to us, well, not given to us, that we paid for, significant sums of money, um, we tended to assume they must be right, partly because it was the only thing we had, um, partly because if we were paying that sort of money, then they must be right, surely. Um, yeah, spoiler alert. Um, where we are at the moment is that open data and transparent process means it's possible to check. The possibility that someone will check, and this goes right back to my, my very early days doing, um, putting my lab notebook online um, like 20 years ago. It wasn't that anyone was looking at my lab notebook, but the fact that it was online was a really strong incentive to make it better and clearer and more accurate. Um, so for us, in terms of the, the websites we're producing, the reason I you know, make clear that there was previously an issue with the data we had for RMIT is that someone's going to check that, or if they don't, they certainly possibly can. It's better for us to get out ahead, and it's important for us to keep checking and make it easy for people to raise issues. And if we combine transparency and openness with a community commitment, and that's what I'm asking for here, um, not to check everything, but to check where things don't look right, to, to get a sense of, is that number around about correct, um, and report those issues, then we can build an ecosystem that is actually trustworthy, um, not merely trusted by default. Um, so what does that look like? And I think there's a sense of what are the responsibilities here as well as what are the opportunities? So imagine a world where you have access to this data, that you have the systems that work well, that let you bring that information directly into the decisions you have to make, to the reporting you have to do. Um, and that that data, not that you check it every day, not that you necessarily know exactly how the code is configured or, or where the documentation is, but you know that it is there. And you know that if you have to, you can go back and check every single detail of that process. That means we do want you to, to check our working, especially if the numbers are too good to be true. Again, looking around all the reporting about the QS and the light and ranking, lots of people tweaking things to find out where they were at the top, what story they can tell that makes it look good, despite the fact that a lot of these things are pretty much magic eight balls. Um, is Melbourne really that much better than Sydney? Meh. Um, just because QS says a bunch of things, that's a... <laughs> That's a, um, that doesn't, doesn't make it true. Um, and we've got to be very careful about not leaning into the things that tell us things that we think we want to hear as well. Um, we need, you need to be resourced properly to do that, to do that community work and actually to ensure that it provides a good ROI, a good return on investment, because a lot of this work is already being done. A lot of you are probably reporting corrections back to weather science and scopus of things that are wrong or missing or, or whatever. But we're not getting that back. We're not, we're, not, we're not seeing that work for all of us. And ultimately, this is sort of a core thought process and I return to the, the acknowledgement of country at the beginning. You know, this is not just about counting citations or determining levels of open access. It's about being an agent in the analysis of our own work. So imagine that world, imagine what we can do to make it happen. Um, we wrote a book, this is actually now, now quite old, but if you're interested in more of the sort of theoretical background for the thinking behind this, including the links to, to EDI and, and how metrics work, then this book is of course open access. Um, and I go back to the goal that we set ourselves at the beginning of the project, which is to change the stories that universities tell about themselves. Not necessarily, if I come back to my title, by just putting information in the hands of people. We thought that would be enough, um, and it wasn't. We can give people information, but they don't get trusted. The information as a lever for change involves changing the way we use and think about this information. At the end of the day, as knowledge institutions, we have standards and systems and approaches. We expect transparency and reproducibility. We expect integrity and honesty in the way data is, protect, is reported. What does it mean to imagine a sector, a system, an ecosystem where we all work together to do the same as we do in research and teaching, to bring quality and clarity, 
where it's available, uh, to get into the difficulties and the challenges and the complexities where we have to, and ultimately to collaborate towards providing a better knowledge ecosystem. And I'll finish there and very happy to take any questions. Great, thank you very much for that, Cameron. Uh, now we do have some questions in the Q&A and lots of applaud emojis popping up in my screen. Hopefully everyone can see those. Um, now the Q&A doesn't just let you uh, ask questions, but you can also vote on questions. And I will be relying on these votes to, to prioritize which questions to ask. Uh, so with a couple of votes, um, a question, well, starting with a comment, I love the idea of building a trustworthy ecosystem. Do you think this is possible whilst we have money and traditional impact metrics involved in the OA process? Do we need to overthrow the whole system? Um, yeah, great question. Um, yes and yes. <laughs> um, so I think one of the things we've learned um, we do need to overthrow the whole system right at its core, but we do that in the foundations. Um, one of the things that we learned early on um, is that you can't just provide an entirely different uh, system or perspective. Um, you have to deliver, particularly the senior leadership who are very time poor, are very focused on a wide range of things, things that are familiar enough. Um, and you have to find the leaders. So this is why we're working on the ERA. ERA was perhaps, yeah, we'll see what happens. Um, but it certainly was a lever which would have got the attention um, of the sector. Um, it's why we're doing other work, for instance, with UNESCO um, and also with CWTS, um, trying to put this open data ecosystem in the places where people are already looking. But at the same time, we have to work from the other side. And I, I know I'm asking a lot um, because yeah, this audience is very time poor, very overworked, trying to cover all of the things. Um, you know, how do we get that properly resourced? How do we make that case? Um, and I think part of the answer is, I'll be honest, uh, cancel a few products. Um, there's quite a lot of money to be, to, be, to, be, to be wrapped up there to be put to better use. Um, that's, and again, I know cancellation is not an easy thing. I'm not, I'm not saying that lightly. Um, so we'd also need to figure out how to, how to get the resourcing so that when you know, your deputy vice chancellor turns to you and says, well, what about this thing, that there's enough knowledge and capacity to be able to, to address that. Um, and it's tough. Um, so I think we have to overthrow tactically and strategically. Um, choose our fights, choose which hill to die on, um, and find where the places, where the levers are, where we can make change. Um, you know, I made enough mistakes in my life tackling the wrong problems. Um, uh, I got hopefully a little older and wiser now, but um, but yeah, there's it's it's not easy. Um, so what what I what I guess I would ask is 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 that sense of do the at least do the easy things. Um, you know, when you spot so so often when we see, and I do this myself, I'm guilty of this myself, right? You see a thing, um, and there's a problem, there's an issue with a number or this or the other, and and you think, oh, and then you leave it, you move on to the next thing. Um, the we need to be better at on our side for making it easy to report those things. Um, you know, we've been working on that, and that's that's actually a harder problem than you might think. Um, but I guess I would ask you, when you see something, yeah, when you see something, say something. <laughs> um, and then, but in a way that's helping us to build this, 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 this bigger ecosystem so we can try and find where the problems are. Great, okay, leavers. So I will stop assembling a guillotine and singing La Marseillaise. Um, so the next question with the most upvotes, um, why do you think there are not a lot of people looking at the dashboard? Is it not wanting to know, or are there not enough stakes resting on a high open access score or something else? So, so thanks for that question. Sorry, I probably went a little bit too fast there. Actually, there are a lot of people looking at the looking at the dashboard. Um, what we know is there are relatively few people digging deeper into the 
the explanation of how it works and even fewer going down to the next level of, of documentation and code. So, and one of the ways we can tell this is we do, and again, this is partly we need to do more work on making things clearer. Um, we get a lot of questions about how it works that are in fact answered by the how it works page on the website. Um, yeah, which is again, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, people are busy. Um, you see a number, what you, you, um, it doesn't quite make sense. Um, uh, so, so I think what we've found, um, so I mean, open access is high stakes in other places, um, uh, at much higher stakes in, in many places. And you can see that in the levels of, of open access in Australia versus Northwestern Europe or versus the UK for certain, for certain um, but also places like the Netherlands, um, Scandinavia and others where there's real teeth on those policies um, and real money. So, so where it is high stakes, people are interested in the question. Um, a lot of them are, are looking, but where it's high stakes, there's also a lot more local work being done on, on tracking um, open access. Um, in Australia, that seems to be mainly people are interested, people are, are wanting to tell a story, they get a sense of, of where things are. Um, Will that change? I think that depends again on whether policy shifts to have real teeth. Um, uh, you know, funders have been um, reticent in the Australian context to put real teeth behind those open access policies. Um, and yeah, I think there's a there's an there's clearly still opportunities there to improve um, rates, capacities, and whatnot. Um, but yeah, as the stakes get higher, people start to pay more attention um, and the stakes are very contextual, so. Yep, certainly. Now we have a suggestion from somebody and hopefully I am interpreting this correctly, that the, the something else could possibly be, we're not digging down into the dashboard because we don't necessarily understand it. Yeah, and I think that's, um, again, that's a, the challenge. Um, we tried to make, we worked very hard at trying to make the dashboard easy to use. That meant alighting a lot of the complexity. Um, and so then there's a gap. And so this is, this is the sort of the real challenge. Um, how do we get from, um, like I say, it's, it's, it's easy enough for me to say, oh, well, but the code's all there, the data's all there, you can dig all the way back. Um, provided you understand Python, SQL, Apache, um, CSS, <laughs> you know, um, the data structures and APIs of OpenAlex and Crossref. Yeah. You know, um, so I turn that actually into a into a question, um, or at least a, a, a request for ideas. Um, we're working more on flow diagrams, so trying to make it clear where each data element actually comes from in the different data sets. Um, that's one thing we're trying to do to make it to make it to make it possible to tell one of the questions we often get. Right, so what's this publication date? Where's the publication date come from? Because if you've ever done anything looking at publication dates in the bibliographic record, you'll know you can get pretty much any date you want, depending on which data source you go for. Um, we always use the Crossref issued date. And we do that because it's the only date that's actually comprehensive across all of the elements we're currently tracking. Gonna be a problem when we get beyond Crossref, but that's another, that's, that's another bridge to cross. Um, so we always use that, um, but that matters. So if you use, so that issued date um, can be anything up to a year earlier than what Weather Science um, is reporting because Weather Science tends to privilege the formal published date. And if you're policing embargoes, that's a difference that matters. Um, so we've leaned towards the earliest online date um, as the one that, but it's, but being able to say that, it's easy for me to say that, what does that mean in terms of how it flows through the system is a, is a, is a difficult question. Um, so I don't know, is the, are flowcharts helpful? Um, is that still too complicated? Um, we can, we always struggle because we want to write write out all the detail, but the de the detail is it is it's just complicated um, to get these things together. So, yeah, I'm not sure um, 
how do, you know, we need to tackle all of these things, but we also, in an ideal world, would um, have you know, a lot more people able to engage in those details. Um, and so again, you know, I know that a lot, a lot of people spend a lot of time figuring out how to drive insights and SciVal. Um, again, imagine if we could take that expertise and apply it at the same level, the same sort of facility um, and understanding of the detail and get that same attention applied to the whole, you know, the parts of the ecosystem that matter. Great, thank you. Uh, yeah, I've I've been spending some time recently thinking about what does it mean to be published, but in the term in terms of a data set. Um, so uh, we're running close to time. We need a break in about three minutes. So one last uh, comment to raise. Um, I suspect there's something in human psychology or culture which means there's an implicit warranty when you are paying money for something, whereas when you get something for free. If it's wrong, you'd expect the response to be, oh, well, it's free. What did you expect? So the reassuring thought that you have recourse if something's wrong simply because you've paid for it means it feels more trustworthy. Yeah, and that's 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 a real thing. Um, I think it's that's in part something we we need to shift. But flip that the other side, if what you're saying is we should be charging you 100 grand, um then you know that would solve our sustainability challenges um and and realistically i mean i think the other I'm, there are lots of it's it's easy to get sort of cynical and sarcastic but actually there is a there's also a trustworthiness point here of to and to m's point around professional development there's no point investing a huge amount of professional development and capacity building in something that you're not sure is going to be there in three or five years time so actually, if you have skin in the game, if you are paying for the sustaining of something, then you have an investment in it. Um, so I think there's a positive element there. Um, I we're not not about to ask you to to suddenly find extra money in your budgets because I know that doesn't exist, um, except by cancelling things. I'll come back to that point. But um, as we go up the uh, the tree in your organisations, those amounts of money start to become um, more accessible and more more plausible. Um, and you know, spoiler alert, that's where we're targeting um, that. And again, it's absolutely right. Um, you know, um, the if your DBC is paid for something, then I expect they will have a degree of due diligence they will put in to make sure that it is trustworthy.